Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture four. So we're still on some of the stuff that I absolutely love. Um, we're going to continue focusing in on genetics related concepts. So today we'll focus on mutations, gene transfer and biotechnology. Now, the first thing that we want to talk about with regard to the genetic stuff that we're going to go through today is the fact that you know, sometimes things go wrong with DNA. You know, we've kind of covered the idea of DNA replication, transcription, translation, all of that fun stuff. And as you saw, it can be quite complicated and there are a lot of steps where things can go wrong. Now, when something goes wrong with DNA, what do you call it? It's called a mutation. Okay, mutations are a change in a cell's genetic material, meaning a change in their DNA sequence, in their code. Now, most mutations are neutral and you never even notice they occur, but there are harmful ones. And even though they're rare, they're more noticeable because of the fact that, you know, they're so detrimental. Now, they are rare because they tend not to carry on. Think about it. If a mutation is really bad and it kills an organism early, so for instance, sometimes it will kill uh, an organism before it even gets a chance to be born. Well, if it's killing that organism early, that organism doesn't get a chance to reproduce, so that mutation doesn't get passed on, okay? Plus, if you think about genetics, you always have two alleles for each gene, right? because you have one allele for mom, one allele from dad. So even if you have a harmful mutation in one, you usually have a second copy to then make up for that. Now, there are also some beneficial mutations, and these get evolutionarily maintained. What that means is, if it's beneficial, then it's going to increase the chances of that organism surviving. And if that organism survives, what do they have a better chance of doing? Reproducing. So now if they reproduce, then that mutation will get passed on. But keep in mind, it's only passed down if it is in the germline. And what's germline mean? It's a fancy way of saying they're gametes, meaning they're sex cells. So, for instance, sperm or egg. Now, there are a whole bunch of different types of mutations. Some of the major ones are base substitutions, insertions, deletions, inversions, duplications, and translocations. The ones that we'll focus on or that I want you to circle are base substitutions, insertions and deletions okay just to briefly summarize what each of these things are before we go into the details of some of the more significant ones uh, base substitution simply means that in the dna sequence one nitrogen base has been replaced with another okay so that means one of those four letters the a t g or c has been replaced by another. So for instance, you're supposed to have a G somewhere and suddenly it's a T, okay? Insertion means that one of the bases has been added into the DNA sequence. So if the sequence is supposed to be CAC, well now maybe it's CATC. A deletion is exactly what it sounds like. One or more bases have now been removed from the DNA sequence. So for instance, if it was supposed to be CAC, and now it's CC, okay? Inversion means that the segment of DNA has stayed in the same location, but has flipped. So for instance, if it was supposed to be a sequence of CAT, now it's TAC. Duplication is exactly what it sounds like. You end up with multiple copies of the same little piece of DNA. So for instance, for that same example of CAT, well now it's CAT, CAT, CAT. And sometimes that can be good if, you know, if that produces a very valuable protein and now you have more of it, but sometimes that's bad where you don't want a lot of something. 
The last one here is translocation, which location, location, location in the name means that it has moved to a different location in the DNA. So a piece of the sequence is now not where it's supposed to be, it's somewhere else. But like I said, we're going to focus on base substitutions, insertions, and deletions. So for base substitution, there's a few different terms that I want you to know. With base substitution, the first option is a missense mutation. Okay, so circle the word missense mutation. What this means is that a single nucleotide, so that means an A, T, G, or C, has been changed and now when transcription and then translation occurs of that sequence, there's now a different amino acid than was supposed to be in the final protein product. Okay, This missense mutation can either be conservative or radical. So the way I like to explain it to students, the difference between these two, is I first like you to think of radical. What does the word radical mean in English? Radical is very different, right? So a radical substitution or radical replacement means that if that original amino acid was supposed to have a particular chemical property, such as a positive charge, well now it has a different chemical property, such as a negative charge. Why is that significant? What do you know about the charges of these amino acids. Remember we talked about the R groups, we said that these charges affect how that protein will fold. So now with the radical replacement, there is going to be a difference in folding and a difference in interactions because if that protein was supposed to have a more positive charge, now it's negative, well now it's going to interact differently. The original would have been attracted, if it's positive, would have been attracted to negatives and would have repelled positives. Now the complete opposite occurs, okay? So if that's radical, then what do you think conservative is? Conservative means not much of a change. So yes, there will be a different protein as you see in this figure here. So for instance, there was supposed to be an alanine, mutation happens, now it's a glycine instead. But these two have very similar chemical properties. So the way the protein actually folds and interacts is going to be the same, even though there's a different amino acid there. So that's a conservative substitution. And if we go based on the charges we were talking about before, if let's say the original protein was supposed to be a positive charge, if a conservative substitution occurs, the new amino acid will also have a positive charge. So again, the protein will fold and interact the way that it's intended. Okay, so make sure you understand the meaning of missense mutation, conservative substitution, and radical replacement. So missense means there's a different amino acid now. Conservative specifies that that new amino acid is very similar to the original. Same charge, for instance. Radical means the new amino acid is very different. So for instance, a different charge than the original. The other possible base substitution is a nonsense mutation. And what I do for this one is I shout at the students, stop the nonsense. Okay, when you hear nonsense mutation, think stop the nonsense. Because what happens with this one, the new sequence change leads to a stop codon instead of an amino acid, okay? So a missense mutation led to a different amino acid. A nonsense mutation leads to a stop codon. And what does a stop codon do? It terminates translation, which means that once that DNA sequence gets transcribed and translated, the protein is going to end early. So now it'll be shortened, which we call a truncated protein. And this short protein, one of two things can happen. If it's shortened, well, now it's not gonna do its proper job in the cell, right? 
structure defines function. So you may not have that function occurring, or it may mess things up, kind of picture it getting stuck where it shouldn't or kind of, you know, interfering with things. Or what usually happens is the cell will detect a truncated protein, a short protein, and it will label it for degradation. It gets chopped up, okay? Proteolysis, right? Chopping up proteins. So now you're thinking, well, we got rid of the mistake. So that's good, right? Wrong. What's the problem? The problem is you don't have the protein you intended. Okay, so yes, you got rid of the mutant protein, but you still don't have the product that you wanted or you needed at that moment. So a nonsense mutation can be quite an issue. But again, make sure you're comfortable with the difference between missense mutation and nonsense mutation. The next point I want to make when it comes to mutations is that the severity or the issues with mutations depends on the number of bases affected, especially when it comes to insertion and deletion mutations. Because mutations can affect the, free, the reading frame. And as we know, sequences are read as codons, okay, sets of three. So if a, a change, let's say insertion or deletion, is not a set of three, so for instance, it's only one or two bases, then when the cell goes to read that sequence and it's reading in sets of three, everything after that mutation is going to be messed up, will be a different code, different amino acids, completely read wrong. Now that is called a frame shift, okay? So if a mutation occurs, you hope that it occurs as a set of three, because if it is not, not a set of three, then you end up with a frame shift and everything is messed up after that point. The last thing that I want to mention for this lecture and for mutation specifically is the term mutagens. Anytime that you hear something is a mutagen, it means that it can cause a genetic mutation. These agents or items can be chemical or radiation as most people think of, but they can also be microbes, okay? Microbes such as HPV or H. pylori, for instance, and even the, the um, Epstein-Barr virus, which most people think of as mo causing mono, all of these have been found to be mutagens, meaning they cause genetic mutations and thus can cause cancer. Okay, so I want you to put little stars around HPV and H. pylori, especially HPV, because we're going to talk about that a lot in later lectures, okay, to remind yourself that not just, you know, common things like radiation and chemicals that people fear for causing cancer, but also microbes can cause cancer. So be very careful about infections and your exposure to these things. You know, a lot of them are preventable, especially the sexually transmitted infections like HPV. And HPV has now become the leading cause of cervical cancer, throat and mouth cancer, and rectal cancer. A lot of people are now dying from this infection down the line, okay, because it stays within you. So please keep in mind that not just UV or cigarette smoke or chemicals can be mutagens, but also microbes such as HPV. Okay, so just to make sure that you're paying attention and watching the videos like you're supposed to, here is one of those surprise remind app messages. Basically, I want you to stop everything and message me in Remind so that I could track that you have been truly watching the video. All I want you to do is when you get to this point in the video, simply send me a message in Remind telling me of at least one other mutagen that you've heard of that was not included in the picture on the previous slide. And since this is not a test or, you know, it's not an exam or a quiz or anything, 
you can use the internet. Simply, you know, tell me what you find as an interesting mutagen that maybe, you know, you never would have expected or something that concerns you. Maybe you're like, oh, you know, I used to eat so and you know, whatever product or I used to, you know, do whatever thing and now I don't want to because I just found out that, hey, there's a possible mutagen there. Okay, so just once you get to this slide, pause the video and contact me and remind to tell me at least one other mutagen that was not on the previous slide. And again, you could look it up. I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, it'll just teach both of us maybe a new mutagen. Okay, thank you and keep going strong. Now, enough about mutations. Now we're going to focus, rather than on, you know, the bad stuff that can happen, uh, we're going to focus now on the good stuff that can happen with DNA, the valuable stuff. Basically, all of the fun things and useful things that we can do with DNA. Now, keep in mind what we go through today. This is just a sampling of what we can do with DNA. The, the actual abilities that we have are so vast now. And, and so widespread that we couldn't possibly cover it in just one lecture. The first thing that I want to mention is in microbiology, you know, we kind of teach you that bacteria aren't always bad. There are a lot of good, helpful ones in your normal flora, and bacteria can be quite valuable and helpful in the realm of research, in the realm of product development. So, you know, the food industry, the medical industry, all over. Some of the ways that they are valuable to us is their ability for bacterial gene transfer. Meaning the idea that you could get new DNA, new sequences, new genes, put into a bacteria and you could then have them replicate it, make lots of copies, you know, really play around with the genetic code and get bacteria to be nice little factories for you basically. Now there are three forms of gene transfer that I want you to know. You have to know the difference between each of them. The first one is transformation. And in transformation, the way we define that is the uptake of naked DNA by bacteria. Okay, so what that means is basically you have a bacteria that needs to be made competent, so meaning that it's able to be, you know, ready to take in DNA. And then you have regular old naked DNA, meaning just strands of DNA around that cell, not in any kind of structure or cell, just free floating DNA, and you get the bacteria to take that DNA in. The other form of gene transfer that you see on this slide that sounds a little similar is transduction. And the difference with transduction is that the bacteria is still taking in new DNA, but the way it's doing it is by virus vector, meaning a virus injects new DNA into the bacteria. The third form of gene transfer that we have here is conjugation. And my students like to remember it as conjugal visits. Okay, if you don't know what that is, I will not explain it. But for those of you who do know what that is, it's a little trick that can help you remember that conjugation is ba basically a fancy way of saying bacteria sex. Because as you can see in this third picture, in conjugation, one bacteria cell is getting DNA from another. And the way they transfer it or they get that DNA is through the formation of a sex pillus, basically a little narrow tunnel for DNA to transfer from the donor to the recipient. Okay, so when you look at these three forms of gene transfer, ask yourself, how is the bacteria getting the new DNA? In transformation, the bacteria is getting pure DNA from the surrounding area. In transduction, the bacteria is getting new DNA from a virus. And lastly, in conjugation, the bacteria is getting new DNA from another bacteria cell. In case you missed any of that, you can pause on this recap and jot down some notes.
So now, in a, in a, a gene transfer experiment like transformation, where you have DNA coming from the environment around the cell where it's not in any other structure such as a virus or another bacteria you have to make sure that you make the cells competent and competent means ready to take in new dna okay meaning you have to make the cells the proper charge so i'm going to draw out what we mean by this when you have a bacterial cell so bacteria you have that outer membrane of the bacteria and that outer membrane is highly negative because there's a lot of lipopolysaccharides okay so the bacterial cell is highly negative now you want that bacteria to take in dna from the environment and what do you know about dna what charge does dna have well, because of the phosphate backgrounds, DNA is highly negative. Okay, so you have bacteria that's negative, and you have DNA that's negative. What's the problem with this? You want the bacteria to take in that DNA, but right now, what do you know about same charges? They repel each other when the charge is the same. So right now, that DNA doesn't want to go anywhere near that bacteria cell. So how do you get that DNA to become attracted to the bacteria? You make the bacteria competent by coating it in positive charges. And the way, one of the ways we usually do that is by adding calcium chloride. So can add calcium chloride and what that does is the calcium when you put that calcium into the the transformation solution the calcium and the chloride separate from each other and calcium is highly positively charged so those calcium plus two ions they coat the bacterial cell okay that's all these plus charges that you see those are calcium ions coating the bacteria cell okay so calcium coats bacteria in positive charges and so we call that creating an ion bridge okay because these plus charges are a bridge connecting the negative DNA with the negative cell, okay? So the calcium ions are a positive bridge, okay? So we call that giving the cell chemical competency, all right? So with transformation, anytime you hear that term, please remember that you must first make the bacteria competent please understand what that means so competent is making the cell ready to take in new dna by affecting the charge of the cell okay make sure you remember that the bacterial membrane is negatively charged the dna is negatively charged so they normally repel each other you add calcium chloride you add positive charges to create an ionic bridge to kind of bridge the two together to make the DNA now highly attracted to that bacteria because it sees the bacteria now as positive. And as you know, opposites attract. So the negative DNA is now attracted to the positive bacteria. If you have any questions on this, please contact me in the Remind app. So the first thing I want you to know is what it means when you hear the term recombinant DNA okay, or recombinant DNA technology. So basically what you're doing with recombinant DNA technology is you are copying, cloning, or manipulating DNA because recombinant DNA
usually refers to DNA that has two different pieces of DNA put together. Okay, so recombinant DNA, think of it as a, a hybrid of different DNA pieces. Okay, so it has new genes that have been introduced to it. Okay, now when you do recombinant DNA work, meaning genetic engineering, you're going to use two key tools. The first one is restriction enzymes. Those you usually hear called nucleases. Okay, so make sure you write down the word nucleases to describe enzymes that will cut DNA. Okay, and these basically they're highly specific and will only cut certain sequences. And if that particular sequence is only found in the DNA sequence once, okay, you get one cut. If it's found three, four, five times even, the enzyme will cut every single time that it encounters that particular sequence. Okay. Now, in addition to using these nucleases, you also will use a cloning vector. So you've used those in lab classes while at Georgian court. Um, some of them might have been P blue or the puck one used in the um, ligation and uh, transformation kit. Okay. Cloning vector is basically a fancy way of saying a plasmid. Okay. So you see the plasmid here, round piece of DNA. Now remember, plasmids are usually these circular pieces of DNA, they're extra chromosomal, meaning that they are beyond the life function chromosomes. And most importantly, these cloning vectors can give bacteria an advantage. And make sure you always know what advantage is it that a plasmid or cloning vector can give to bacteria? Antibiotic resistance. Okay, make sure you write down that cloning vectors can give bacteria antibiotic resistance. So when you're going to use recombinant DNA technology or basically genetic engineering, a lot of times we call it molecular cloning. And what you have to do is you cut a target gene out of a genome and then you cut a vector with the same nuclease, the same enzyme, okay? And once you do that, those two pieces of DNA, your target gene that you cut out of a genome from either human or yeast or bacteria, that target gene that you cut out of a genome now has the same sticky ends as the vector that you just cut open with the same enzyme. So now what you're able to do, as you see in this fig figure on the slide, is you can ligate them together, okay? You take that gene that you cut out of a big genome, and you take that vector that you cut open in just one spot, and you glue together those pieces. Once you have that DNA ligated, what can you then do? Well, now you could do transformation. And what's transformation? That's basically getting bacteria to take in that new plasmid, that vector, that has your target gene in it. And in the example on this slide, the picture, the target gene that was used is GFP, or green fluorescent protein. And so now that bacteria that has the plasmid with the GFP that you put into it, well, now they can glow green in the presence of UV light. So that's what I said in, in lab courses when you got to do transformations. So it's a very powerful tool. You can give bacteria new genes, which gives them new abilities. They can produce completely new enzymes or proteins that they never had the ability to produce before. And like I said before, remember that one of those things that you can give them is antibiotic resistance, okay, which is very beneficial to the bacteria. And it's also useful in your research as well to help you find the successful transformants later.
Now, this is something that you may have seen or remembered from lab, okay? When we talk about cloning vectors, there are four main qualities that a cloning vector or plasmid should have in order to be valuable for genetic engineering or transformation, okay? The first one is that the plasmid should be fairly small. And when you ask yourself, you know, why should this plasmid be fairly small? Well, think about what you want to do with it. You want that DNA ring to get into bacteria. And remember, those bacteria have teeny tiny little pores on the outside of their outer membranes. So if that plasmid is nice and small, that increases your chance of getting the bacteria to get that DNA inside of it. Okay, so for the first why, why should the plasmid be fairly small? To help it get into the bacteria. The next bullet point we have is that the plasmid should have an origin of replication. Why is that? Well, it's in the name. You want that DNA to be copied and maintained in the bacteria once the DNA has gotten in. Okay, so the origin of replication allows the bacteria to copy and maintain your plasmid genes. Okay, then we say that the cloning vector should have at least one selectable marker. Okay, and think of the labs that you've done with transformations. What are some selectable markers that we tend to use? Well, one I've mentioned repeatedly already in the few minutes of this lecture, which is antibiotic resistance. The other is a color change, okay? So if at the end of this experiment, after incubating, your bacteria now can grow in the presence of something like ampicillin, or if it suddenly turns blue when it grows in the presence of something like Xcal, well, then you know those bacteria successfully took in your plasmid, okay? So that's why selectable markers are so valuable is that they allow you to see which of your bacteria successfully took in the plasmid, okay? Which are the successful transformants? The last of the bullet points is the word that students always hate. They always forget how to say it. That's endonucleases. And endonucleases, what they do is they cut open DNA. So if you remember when we talk about molecular cloning, we said that you want to be able to cut this plasmid open, put new genes into it. Okay, so that's the why of restriction sites or endonuclease sites, is you need to be able to manipulate that plasmid. Okay, you need to be able to cut it open. And usually we call these MCS which stands for multiple cloning sites, okay? Multiple cloning sites because these are sites on the plasmid that allow for molecular cloning. They allow you to cut open the plasmid and then insert new genes, okay? So I'm going to have a brief recap on the next slide just so you get time to write down what we just said. Okay, so here is the recap slide. You can pause the video and take down the notes in case you missed anything I said in the last slide. Okay, so now when we talk about plasmids, a lot of times you'll hear them called multiple copy or multi-copy plasmid vectors. Basically that means, so I'm gonna bring all the bullet points out here. Basically, that means that these plasmids, especially if they have their proper origin of replication, they can make multiple copies of themselves within the bacteria so that the bacteria can then have high levels of them, okay? Which is very valuable to us as researchers because basically the bacteria can become little factories for us. Okay, because if they have multi-copy plasmids, they can make many, many copies of the plasmid and then express those new genes at high levels for us. Okay, now the one of the, the most commonly used ones 
today. Uh, it came from what we call the coal E1 plasmid that E. coli naturally had. And what researchers did was they took this original, so look on the slide here, they took this original plasmid that they found in E. coli and they removed what was called the colicin production genes. And the reason they moved, removed that is colicin is a bacteriocin. And what that means is it's a toxin that kills some bacteria. Okay, and you may ask yourself, well, why would a bacteria produce a toxin that kills bacteria? Well, it allows it to reduce competition. So especially if they kill off the more similar kind of slightly related bacteria, they get to hoard or have more of the, the resources they need. Okay, but you don't want that in your plasmid because then it would kill off your experiment. So researchers removed the, uh, the colicin gene, and then they added what's called the beta-lactamase gene. Okay, they added antibiotic resistance. And why would they want to add the beta-lactamase gene? Well, now if you use this plasmid in research, if it gets into the bacteria, then you'll know because that bacteria will now be able to survive on ampicillin plates. Okay, so you've done this kind of transformation in multiple of your classes, most likely by now. Okay, so keep in mind when you think about plasmid vectors, remember that the original one was from E. coli and they had to remove the colicin gene and add in the beta lactamase gene. Okay, and understand why they wanted that beta-lactamase gene in there. <clears throat> so now we get to inserting genes into vectors, which we've, you know, basically been talking about so far. But I want to kind of give you some general rules about doing this. So what you want to do in molecular cloning is you want to cut that plasmid and then cut the gene of interest with the same restriction enzyme. Okay, because we remember, remember we said you're getting that gene of interest from another cell's genome. So you have to cut out that gene of interest and you want to use the same restriction enzyme so that it will have sticky ends that properly ligate to the vector that you cut. Okay. Now, when you're going to do this, there's certain rules you have to keep in mind. The first one is when you cut, you should only cut the vector once. Okay, you want to open up the vector so that you can glue in the new gene. But what would happen if you cut the vector more than once? You didn't open it up now. You completely chopped it up and it becomes useless at that point. Okay, so you want to make sure you only cut the vector once. You also want to make sure you're not cutting into any genes that are necessary for plasmid stability or survival. If you cut an important gene, then you might end up killing the bacteria when you try to put that plasmid in, or the plasmid won't work. Basically, to help avoid problems, a lot of the vectors of the plasmids have been modified. So they contain what's called a polylinker or the multiple cloning site we just mentioned a minute ago. That way you have a lot of different options, okay? You have multiple sites to choose from so that you're most likely not, you know, kind of running into the problems we just mentioned. Now, once you have cut the vector in the gene of interest, the next thing you have to do is use DNA ligase to join the Make sure you remember, if you're going to do genetic engineering, you have to cut the plasmid, and then you cut the gene of interest with the same enzyme. You only cut that plasmid once, and then you use DNA ligase, which is like glue, to stick together the gene of interest and the vector. Okay, so now you should have a nice full plasmid with an extra gene in it. This slide here is to show you what I meant 
by the polylinker and by the process that we just talked about. Okay, so it helps you visualize. Now, keep in mind, not all plasmids will have that insert or the, um, the, the polylinker. And ligation is not always perfect, okay? When you do this process, not every vector is going to get cut open. Not every vector is going to get the intended gene. Because remember, in lab, we had mentioned that when you do this type of uh, experiment, when you cut that vector open, and then you put it with these DNA pieces that you want to stick into there, well, look at these. These guys also want to stick back to each other. They match. So a lot of times when you do the experiment, a lot of your plasmids will actually re-ligate on each other and not have the insert. So basically, you need to make sure that there are ways for you to detect which plasmid successfully got cut open and actually took in the gene of interest, okay, which you see here with the plasmid and the gene of interest, rather than just sticking to themselves. So now on this slide, we're going to start going into some ways that you can detect whether your plasmid successfully took in the gene of interest. Now keep in mind, this is different from the selectable markers we talked about earlier. Things like color detection and um, antibiotic resistance, that was just to show if your plasmid has made it into the bacteria. And that doesn't tell you whether or not your gene made it into the plasmid. Because remember, some of the plasmids will just stick to themselves, okay, rather than taking in the gene. So to try and determine whether your plasmid has successfully taken in the gene, you can do a few things. One thing that you can do is you can isolate from the bacteria, you pull out the plasmid DNA, and you cut it with the same enzymes that you used in cloning. And think about it. If you look at this picture on the bottom of the slide, if you isolate plasmid DNA from the bacteria, and you cut it with the enzymes from cloning. If that plasmid only re-ligated to itself, which is this guy here, then when you cut it with that enzyme, it'll only cut once, and you'll see one linear strip of DNA. If, however, it took in the insert successfully, when you now cut it with the enzyme, look, that's one, two cut sites, right? So now when you run this on a gel, you'll see one, two pieces of DNA instead of one linear piece. Okay? If you have trouble visualizing that, just send me a remind message and I'll go over it in a little more detail. Okay, so what we just covered here, if you want to detect an insert in the plasmid, one way is to just simply extract the, DN the plasmid DNA and cut it with the same enzyme. If you see one band of DNA, then it is linear. It did not take in the insert. If you see two bands of DNA, then it did take in the insert. It successfully took in the insert. Another thing that you can do is insertional, insertional inactivation which is what you did in laboratory if you, you perform the blue and white uh, ligation transformation technique. And so we're going to go over that one in more detail in the coming slides. And then you have the option to do the order genes, which kind of a lot of times we combine with insertional inactivation because the reporter genes basically let you visualize things. So these are things like color changes, like seeing blue color of colonies or white color of colonies. Okay. So this is the insertional inactivation method of trying to see if your um, bacteria successfully took in the insert or the new gene. Okay, this is basically what you see in the blue and white ligation transformation experiment. 
So you have this plasmid over here, okay? In this example, it's not the blue and white case, in this example, the plasmid will have two different antibiotic resistance genes, okay? This top one is antibiotic resistance for ampicillin, for instance. This bottom one is amp, um, antibiotic resistance for canamycin, for instance. Okay, so amp resistance and can resistance. Now, if you successfully cut open this vector and insert a gene, well, what do you notice? That gene just destroyed the canamycin resistance. Okay, so any bacteria that has a plasmid that simply religated on itself and never took in a gene, they'll still have AMP and canamycin resistance. If, however, it took in the new gene, it'll have AMP still working, but it will not be canamycin resistant. Okay, so in that case, what you would basically do is you would stamp the colonies that you got from this experiment on two different plates because we have the ability to just stamp them, meaning you put a, a velvet cloth, you pick up your colonies from your transformation, and you gently touch it on an ampicillin plate, and you gently touch it on a canamycin plate. And you look to see which of those colonies from your transformation plate successfully grow on ampicillin, but then die off in canamycin and you still have the original transformation plate to go back and take those colonies and grow them and use them for your experiment because they have the uh, intended gene. Again, if you're having any trouble understanding this one, just send me a remind message and I'll draw out a picture for you to help you visualize this, okay? Now, in the case of our lab experiment, what we do instead of having two antibiotic resistant genes, you have the idea that the vector has the first part of the beta galactosidase gene, and then the bacterial strain has the second part. So when the regular vector meets the bacteria, boom, you get the blue colonies. Remember, we drew this out on the board. Now, if you then insert a gene into that vector, that beta-galactosidase gene is no longer functional, which means you can no longer get blue colonies. Instead, the white colonies are your success. Okay? Again, if you have any trouble, just send me a remind message and I'll explain further. Now this one here is basically what we were just talking about, just to give you a visual idea. This is the idea of um, the plasmid, so just like you did in your experiment. The plasmid having the first part of the beta-galactosidase beta gene, the bacterial chromosome having the second part. You put the plasmid into the bacteria, boom, you have active beta-galactosidase that produces blue colonies. If you then insert your gene right smack in the middle of here in the plasmid, well, then you know that was successful when you no longer get beta-galactosidase working and you get the white colonies. Okay, so this we went over in lab as well. So this should be basically a review. Now, in addition to plasmids, sometimes we use some other uh, types of vectors. Here we have bacteriophage lambda vectors. That's basically saying that you can use lambda, which is a virus, okay? A virus that infects bacteria with its viral genes. And interestingly, the viral genome of lambda is not actually um, all essential. So there's a portion of it that you're able to just, like you see in this figure, you're able to just cut out part of that genome and glue in whatever genes you want and put it back into the bacteriophage, into the virus. And now that virus will go and inject that DNA, including the gene you added, 
into bacteria. Okay, so this is just an alternate route that sometimes um, researchers use. And when you when you do this, when you have a viral vector introducing DNA into bacteria, we call that transduction. Okay, so in lab you perform transformation. This here is transduction. Now, another type of research vector that is commonly used is what we call the TI plasmid. This one's used for plant engineering. TI stands for tumor inducing, okay, not a uh, condition. So it is tumor inducing. And the reason it's called that is because it's actually naturally carried by what's called agrobacterium tumefaciens. And you have all probably seen this at one point or another. That's actually a type of bacteria that gets into plants and especially trees through cuts in their, you know, in their bark. So we call that wounds. So for instance, if your parents ever yelled at you, if you're, you know, um, basically carving into a tree or picking away, peeling with your finger uh, pieces of the bark, when you wound that tree, you open it up to this bacteria. And that bacteria carries a plasmid that has what we call tDNA. And the tDNA, or tumor DNA, basically what that does is what it says, you know, it's, it's tumor causing. It integrates into the plant genome. And what that tDNA has is auxin genes, cytokinin genes, and opine genes. And these are genes that produce enzymes that, as you can see from down here in the figure, promote cell growth, cell division, and feed that bacteria. Now, when you think about this, this bacteria is putting genes that give enzymes to produce more cells, more plant cell division. What is that? That's cancer, right? That is plant cancer. And that's when you see those giant bulbous tumors sticking out of trees that you're going to see on the next slide. So anytime you're walking by or driving by any of the trees, even on campus, that have these big growths sticking out of them, I want you to shout Agrobacterium tumefaciens, okay? Just shout at it. Look at it. You see, look at that tumefaciens. And all your friends will, of course, think you are the coolest person ever because, you know, that is awesomely cool, of course. Okay? Now, we can then use these plasmids in genetic engineering because if this bacteria has the plasmid, which mediates transfer of uh, DNA segments into plant cells, well then what we can do is we can cut out those genes for, for the tumor induction and instead put our own genes in there. And the rest of that plasmid is very good at integrating into plant genomes. Okay, So we're able to modify that plasmid the TI plasmid to take out the bad, the bad bacterial genes and put in our desired genes and boom, now we can get the plants to produce whatever we want, okay? So to help you, so to help you visualize what I was just talking about a minute ago, this is that, you know, crown gall tumors that you might see on campus or uh, various places when you're walking around or driving around. So remember to shout, look at that tumor fashions, okay? And this up here demonstrates what we were just talking about in terms of using the TI plasmid for genetic engineering. So you're able to cut it open, remove those tumor inducing genes and ligate in the genes of your desire. Then when you introduce this plasmid into plant cells, well, that plasmid, as you can see here, is naturally very good at integrating into bacteria, uh, sorry, integrating into plant cells and into plant DNA.
So now the plants produced from that cell will have your desired genes. So for instance, those genes, think about what might you want to give to a plant? What kind of traits? Well, maybe it's a gene to produce bigger fruit. Maybe it's a gene to produce more fruit, more vegetables, okay, more, more product. Maybe it's a gene to grow taller, grow bigger. Okay? Any of these things resist pest, uh, pests, such as, you know, bugs that might try and attack those plants. So that's how we do genetic engineering a lot of times when it comes to plants and crops, is we use the TI plasmid. Okay? Make sure you know, if you see a crown gall tumor, though, that that's thanks to Agrobacterium tumor fashions. Okay, remember that it may pop up again. <laughs>